Now let's stay right there in Colossians chapter 3 this morning. And my subject this morning is found beginning at verse 12 concerning the character of God's elect the character of God's elect. And of course, what we're talking about is the character of believers, sinners saved by the grace of God, who are identified in verse 12 as the elect of God, put on therefore as the elect of God. So we're going to be talking about that, that great truth that many people who claim to believe the Bible find offensive. But it shouldn't be offensive at all. In fact, it should be a, a doctrine of hope. And it is if you understand what the Bible says about us by nature. When we, concern, when we consider the doctrine of election, who are the elect, I'm going to deal with that. But I want to start with this. He says, put on therefore. That word therefore. You've heard me say it. I heard an old preacher years ago say, if you see a therefore in the Bible, find out what it's there for. What does it mean? Well, what Paul is about to do, by, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, he's about to encourage believers in the exercise of godliness, in the exercise of behavior, attitude, character, conduct. That's what he's going to do. But in doing that, he has to remind them of the ground and the basis and the motivation for doing so. And that's the gospel. That's the grace of God. That's what, what God has done for us and in us by Christ who died for us on the cross, who put away our sins, and who sent his spirit to give us life. It's all based upon this, you see. A young man asked me one time, he said he was considering the ministry, preaching, and he asked me, he says, do we have to preach the gospel every time we preach? I was sort of disappointed that he even asked me that question. But I said, well, of course. I said, every sermon ought to evangelize and every sermon ought to edify, both. That's not always an easy task, I, I grant you that. But I said, look at it this way. I said, if you go out and buy the best car in the world, the prettiest, the shiniest, the best built car, and you go to start the car up and it won't start because there's no gas in the tank, what have you got? You got a good looking car, but it won't go because there's no gas in the tank. And preaching obedience, character, conduct, godliness without preaching the gospel is like trying to run a car with no gas. There's nothing to spark it, there's nothing to build the fire, there's nothing to motivate it except what man has naturally, which is either legalism, fear of punishment, promise of earned reward, or something. Dangling the character before them, all of that. And that's evil in God's sight. So Paul says, therefore, put on therefore. And what he's doing, he's reaching back to everything that he'd stated of a believer's completeness in Christ. You remember over in, in chapter 2 and verse 9, he says, for in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is found in the person of Christ, who is God in human flesh. Who is Jesus Christ? You see, this thing about, about salvation, this thing about character and conduct, it's really not about us. It's all about Christ. You understand that, don't you? And that's what he says in verse 10 of chapter 2. And you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So here's what I know about obedience, Christian obedience, true Christian obedience. I'm not just talking about human morality. Because human morality crosses all kinds of different beliefs. You, you say, well, I know, 
somebody will look at a person and say, well, uh, a person who gives to charity. And they say, well, I know that person's a Christian because they give a lot of money to charity. But what if you find out later he's a Buddhist? Or he's a, 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 some other religion that's not Christian? Are, are, are you fo foolish enough to believe that no other religions preach charity and almsgiving? So we're not just talking about human morality here. All right? You, got, you need to understand that. What we're talking about is true godliness, true character of a believer. And what he's telling us right away is this. My, I ought to put out every, every with every fiber of my being efforts to live a godly life in every way. In every way. To be the best I can be. As a pastor, as a preacher, as a husband, as a father, as a brother in Christ. I ought to be the best I can be. There's no excuse for me being anything less. But, first of all, at my best, my efforts do not make me complete before God. I'm complete in Christ. He's my completing. My efforts do not make me righteous in God's sight. You see, only Christ is my righteousness. Back over in chapter 3, that's why I had Brother Jim read the whole chapter. We've been studying this. But look at what he says in verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ. That means when, as you said it, when Christ rose from the dead, I arose because he was my representative. He was my surety. He is my surety. He's my substitute. He's my redeemer. Now, I didn't have anything to do with that. The only thing I had to do with anything that he did in that sense is as represented by fallen humanity, I crucified the Lord of glory. That's what human nature does. Somebody, I heard a preacher say up in, he was preaching up in Toledo, Ohio. He, he was talking about the experience of Christ going to the cross and he had the whole audience crying and it is a sad thing when you think about hum, humanity. And he was crying, and he looked at the crowd, and he said, oh, if I'd have been there, I would have stopped it. I thought, are you kidding me? My friend, that was the sovereign purpose of God from the beginning. You're going to stop that? That's the pride of man. But how was I risen? How, when Christ died, I listen, he said, Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That speaks of a finished work. Christ sitting at the right hand of God. The right hand of justice. The right hand of acceptance. The right hand of fellowship. Christ is seated there because Christ finished the work. He put away my sins. He brought in everlasting righteousness. He completed me in that sense. And so he says, set your affection on things above, not on things above, for you're dead. How am I dead? I'm dead legally to sin's condemnation because Christ died in my stead. My sins were charged to him. He put them away. He washed me clean in his blood. When he died, I died. I wasn't there personally, but I was there in him, in the mind and the purpose of God. When he was buried, I was buried. When he arose again, I arose again. And so I'm dead. I'm dead to the law. The law cannot condemn me. I'm dead to sin. Sin cannot condemn me. I have a righteousness that answers the demands of God's law and justice. And I didn't have anything to do with it. It was all Christ. And so my life is hid with Christ in God. That means I'm protected. That means I'm preserved. I'm safe. Safe. In Christ. He's my refuge. He's my high tower. He's my foundation. He's my rock. He's my fortress. And he concludes, that, he concludes that whole issue in verse 11. He says, Christ is all and in all. Now, therefore. All right, not in order to be. But because you already are. Put on as the elect of God. Holy and beloved. Verse 12. 
And then he lists several things that we should strive for in godliness, not in order to be saved, but because we already are. Complete. Not not in order to be made righteous in God so as to be accepted with God. We strive to be righteous, but not to be accepted with God. Christ, we're accepted in the beloved. You see what I'm saying? So not in order to be made righteous and be accepted with God, but because you already are. Not in order to earn God's favor. Because you, first of all, you cannot earn God's favor. The Bible teaches that God never puts himself in a position where he owes us anything by the way of salvation and all of its blessings and benefits. It's always a free, free gift. And that's what the natural man doesn't understand and want. Remember 1 Corinthians 2? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Their foolishness to him, he cannot know them. Well, back up in verse 12 of that chapter, it says, what he won't accept are the things that are freely given. And what are those things? Everything in salvation and blessedness. Everything in eternal, it's freely given, unconditionally. I didn't earn it, didn't deserve it. It's all a free gift. I'm a, I'm a, great, I'm a grace recipient. And that's the therefore. <laughs> this union, our union with Christ, wherein we see that we're righteous in Christ, we're washed in his blood, we're forgiven, we're sure, certain for heaven's glory. Because he's seated at the right hand of God. That's the ground. That's the motivation for all godly living, all godliness, all fruit unto God. That's why I say we don't, bear, we don't produce fruit, we bear it like the tree bears the fruit. All acceptable obedience. Anything that's accepted with God, it's in Christ. It's washed in the blood of Christ. Did you know that? All good works, they're not good because they're meritorious or because we do them or we're trying to do them or do the best we can. They're only good because God accepts them through his son. Our prayers, I'll never forget the first first few months that I started sitting under the true gospel as an unbeliever. I was an unbeliever. And I heard a pastor preaching on the, a a true gospel preacher preaching on the issue of prayer. And he made a statement. And he said, there's enough sin in the best prayer I've ever prayed to sink a world to hell. And I thought he was crazy. I almost got up and left. But by the providence of God, unbeknownst to me, I sat right there and I kept coming back. But when I understood what the Bible says about us by nature, what we are, sinful and depraved by nature, And then even as believers, how how we struggle with the flesh. My prayers, going through this with my son, my prayers, they haven't always been God-honoring prayers because they've come out of my anger. They come out of my self-pity, even my self-righteousness. And I have to pray, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. Thank God he keeps us. Thank God he will not let us go. I can tell you that right now. You say, you believe in once saved? Well, of course I do. If if God saves you. (laughs) Now, if you save yourself, you're not saved to begin with, and you won't stay there. But God saves his people to the uttermost. He not only saves us, he keeps us, and I know that. You know why God accepts our prayers? Because we have a great high priest who's passed through into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Lord our righteous. He's, he intercedes for us right now. None of living or doing that we do is to rival Christ and his blood and righteousness. His righteousness imputed. That's a perfect righteousness that cannot be taken away from his people and cannot be contaminated with the struggles we have in the flesh. That's his work for us. So that's our whole ground of salvation. That's our whole ground of justification. And that establishes 
the motivation of grace and gratitude and love. If you look down there at verse 15 of Colossians 3, he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Who made peace with God? Somebody said, well, he's making his peace with God. You know, Christ already did that on the cross. The Holy Spirit brings you to be at peace with God by leading you to Christ for salvation, for righteousness, for holiness. And he says, to the which you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Oh, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and so free. Every act of obedience, every act of service, every act of praise ought to be, thank you, Lord. That's what it ought to be. Thank you, Lord. I didn't deserve it. Don't earn it. Oh, you blessed me. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And then here we're commanded to obedience, but before we're exhorted to the obedience, we're said to be the elect of God. Listen to what he says here in verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God. And he says, holy and beloved. This is the reality from which all godliness, all acceptable obedience, all service to God is to be done. That is... These are not goals we're trying to reach by our obedience. It's not do this in order to become God's elect. It's not do this in order to become holy or in, or, or in order to get God to love you. No. No. It's because this is what you are by God's grace in Christ. This is what we are because of his grace. Totally, sovereignly. In Christ, the obedience of a sinner saved by grace is the fruit, not of our own goodness, but of God's goodness. Did you know that? The obedience of a sinner saved by grace is the fruit, not of our own power, but God's power. Paul said that in Galatians chapter 2. He said, it's not I that do it, but Christ that dwelleth in me. The obedience of... Of a sinner saved by grace is the fruit of God's grace in Christ through the Holy Spirit, by the word of God. And it's the proper ethical response to God's grace. Grace, love, and gratitude. Paul called it in Romans 12, our reasonable service. It's only reasonable. If somebody gave you a million dollars today, wouldn't it be reasonable for you to say thank you? Wouldn't that be reasonable? (laughs) I'm talking about a million that you didn't earn or deserve. (laughs) In fact, let's say you went up and slapped him in the face and then he gave you the million. Because that's what we've done. We slapped God in the face when we fell in Adam. Born dead in trespasses and sins, sin against God. What are we? We're sinners Saved by grace. Walking in this world by nature in our self-righteousness and pride, we're all recovering Pharisees. You say, well, I'm not. Well, then you don't have to fight it like I do. Who are the elect of God? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Now, according to the Bible, now, and like I said, this, the, the Bible reveals that God has an elect people. And according to the Bible, the elect of God, and I don't have time to go into all of the scriptures here that deal with that. But according to the Bible, though, the elect are those whom God sovereignly and unconditionally chose to save before the foundation of the world. Look over to Ephesians chapter 1. And there's many, many verses we can go. But now these are verses that people like to ignore now because it just doesn't rub us the right way naturally. It affects our pride. You know, they say there's two views of election. 
One is that God looks down through the, te- looked down through the telescope of time and he foresaw what you would do as far as accepting him or rejecting him and therefore he made his choice that way. Now there's a big, big, there's several problems with that. Number one, it's not in the Bible. And number two, it makes salvation conditioned on the sinner and not on Christ, not on God alone. So it's not in the Bible. And then others say the Augustinian view, that's based upon a man named Augustine and his view of the scripture. Here's the problem was the doctrine of election predates Augustine quite a bit. But here it is. Look at verse 3 of Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated, there's another word people don't like, but there it is in the Bible, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In the Bible, the elect are those whom God gave to Christ and made him their surety, chosen in him. You see, when God does something, he must do it on a just ground. And the just ground cannot be what you would do in the future. God is not a crystal ball gazer. He's not a fortune teller. He's a determiner, the scripture says. Somebody said, well, I can't wrap my mind all around that. Well, join the club. We'll get badges. You see, here's the, here's the point. God is high above us. And the secret things belong to him. Now what belongs to us down here on this earth? Huh? The revealed things. What God, set, what God tells us, lets us in on. Somebody says, well, that's not fair. It's just not fair. It's not just. Read Romans 9. You'll get your answer to that. And by the way, it's the only answer the Bible gives. Who are you? That's what it says. Who do you think you are? Parents, you ever had an argument with your kids and you come down to it and say, who do you think you are? I'm the head of the household. I'm the father. I'm the mother. Because I said so. That's how God teaches us sometimes in in the scripture. You say, I don't believe that. Well, if God said it, I believe it. I've told you about the church marquee sign that I saw up in West Virginia one time. It said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Wrong. God said it, that settles it. (laughs) Whether you believe it or not. Whether I believe it or not. Our believing it doesn't put any authority to it. All God has to do is say it. That settles it. Isn't that right? The Bible says the elect are those for whom Christ died. He called them his sheep. They are those whom Christ gives spiritual life by the Holy Spirit under the preaching of the true gospel. Now, not a false gospel but the true gospel. Now he says, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved. What is it? Who are the holy? Well, the holy here are not those who are sinlessly perfect in themselves. None of us are. If the holy refers to a a person who is sinlessly perfect in themselves, there's no such thing as holiness among men. Now, if we're believers, if we're in Christ, we are sinlessly perfect in Him. Because in Him we're washed in His blood. We're clothed in His righteousness. That's our legal, objective, forensic standing before Almighty God. God will not charge sin to me. Why? Because He charged Him to Christ. Sin cannot condemn me. Why? Because it condemned Christ in my stead. He died for my sin. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see that? So I stand before God righteous, perfectly righteous, complete, not not in myself, not by my works, but in Christ. 
So what does this word holy mean? Well, it's sometimes referred to as sanctified. What does that mean? It means set apart. Turn to 2 Thessalonians, just over a few pages, chapter 2. <clears throat> Who are the elect? Who are the holy? Well, look at 2 Thessalonians 2.13. He says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Who are the beloved? Right here. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation, there's election, through sanctification, setting apart by the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Set apart. In Christ, by the grace of God, in the power of the Spirit, unto belief of the truth. Do you believe the gospel? The true gospel? Wherein the righteousness of God is revealed? Well, look over at Colossians, uh, our 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. That's just right across the page for most Bibles from our text. Listen to what Paul writes here in verse 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Knowing, brethren, beloved... There you go. Your election of God, that God chose you. I know you're loved of God and God chose you. Verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you in word only. It wasn't just words falling on dead ears, but also in power. And in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You heard the gospel. You believed it. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it. Do you believe? If you believe, what is that? That's a gift of God. Isn't that right? You wouldn't have done that on your own. You don't get, listen, you, if you truly believe the gospel, you're not going to give credit to yourself. Look at me, I believed. Thank God I believed. Thank God he didn't leave me in my unbelief. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. I'm not a self-made person. I'm his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, my surety, my substitute, my redeemer, my intercessor, unto, not because of, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now that's the therefore. Look back at Colossians 3. Did God choose me <laughs> before the foundation? Is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? The Lamb slain from the foundation. Did God justify me? Do I have Christ as my righteousness? Is his righteousness imputed to me? Did Christ die for me? Does God love me with an everlasting love from which I cannot be separated according to Romans chapter 8? The redemptive love of God. Do you know that no one can be separated from his redemptive love? That's what the Bible teaches. And they'll, they'll cling to Christ. They'll persevere because he won't let them go. And how can we know all this? Well, do we believe the gospel? Do we set our affection on things above? Do we trust Christ for all of our salvation, all of our forgiveness, all of our righteousness? And then he says in verse 12, all true believers are to put on. Look at that verse 12, put on therefore. This putting on is like wearing clothes. Now, he's not speaking literally here. He's using a metaphor. He's not telling us to try to be something <clears throat> on the outside that we're not on the inside. So what he's saying here is this. These things should characterize our lives as we are the children of God. These things do not save us. They do not make us children of God. But they should characterize us as the children of God. Now, in the next messages that, that I preach, I'll, I'll be gone next week, but... I'm going to go through these things in some detail. But let's just read them. Look at it, verse 12. He said, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. What's he talking about? He's talking about compassion. Be a compassionate people. 
pitiful people. Kindness. You know what kindness is? Be kind. Humbleness of mind. You know what brings humbleness of mind? <clears throat> when God shows us what we are. You look at that person and you say, well, I know they're not a Christian because they did this. Let me tell you something. You better be aware of yourself. And what he says in Galatians 6, we'll look at that in more detail. What am I capable of? I'll tell you, I'm capable of anything any sinner's capable of but for the grace of God. Meekness. What is meekness? That's submission to the will and the word of God. Long-suffering and forbearing. That's putting up with a lot. You say, well, I put up with enough. No, you have. We've got to put up with a lot. Now, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, as so also do you. That's unconditional forgiveness. We're to forgive. How many times? Seventy times seventy. Infinitely. Verse 14, above all these things, put on charity. That's not just charitable giving, that, but that's included, but it's love. And it's a godly love, which is the bond of perfectness. In other words, that's what keeps us together. We, we love Christ. We love his truth. We love his people. In spite of our faults. And he says in verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of God comes through the cross of Christ. It's not sitting down at the end of the day and saying, well, I finally made it. I did what I was supposed to do and I'm at peace with God. No, Christ did it all. To the which you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Gratitude. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. That's what believers do. Our, our faith is not based on speculation, opinion, different denominations. It's what, what is God's word? If God says he chose a people, I believe it. How about you? And he says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's worship, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, he says, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, Jesus. That is, recognizing that we're complete in him and have nothing of our own to boast in and giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now, we'll look at those more in detail in another message. But that's, that's the character of God's elect. And you understand that in everything that he admonishes God's people to do there, none of it, in any expression of it, is a compromise of the gospel. And the reason I say that is because you need to recognize that if, if by the grace of God we refuse to compromise the gospel and speak peace where there is no peace, you will be accused of being mean and unkind. But that's not what God says. We'll look at that in another message.